right here. Right here in my heart. I'm alive and living all because I'm forgiven. I got Jesus right here. Right here in my heart. I love the thrill that I feel when I get together with God's wonderful people. Good morning Riverside Church family and all our friends and family across South Africa and also the world. Today we are still in shock after the devastating news arrived that our head elder Leon Cranfield had passed away suddenly last Sabbath morning. This news was followed about an hour later that brother Mark Lawrence had also passed away suddenly. I'm sure you can remember what you were doing and where you were when the sad news arrived. We find it difficult to digest that these two precious souls could be taken away to rest so suddenly. We don't have the answers to all our questionings, but we will continue to trust and obey God's will for our lives and accept God's will for theirs. Our heartfelt condolences are extended to the Cranfield and Lawrence families for the loss of Elder Leon and Brother Mark. We will continue to pray that God will be your strength during this difficult time. Shall we stand for a moment of silence in honor of the life of Elder Leon and Brother Mark? Dear Father in heaven, bless those who mourn eternal God with the comfort of your love that they may face each new day with hope and the certainty that nothing can destroy the good that has been given. May their memories become joyful, their days enriched with friendship and their lives encircled by your love. Amen. Good morning and happy Sabbath to all our viewers. This weekend, we celebrate Women's Day on Sunday, 9th of August. For our younger generation who might not know, this day commemorates the 1956 march of approximately 20,000 women to the Union Buildings in Pretoria to petition against the country's past laws that required South Africans defined as black to carry a passport known as a pass. As Christian women, we use this month to focus on issues faced by women and to encourage one another in our walk of faith. Good morning, church members. Last but not least, it is my honor to welcome you to our online divine service today. While we long to be in, in God's sanctuary, we are glad to have you online. The important thing is to be able to still praise and worship God wherever we may find ourselves. Please feel very welcome as we invite God's Holy Spirit into our hearts and we await our preacher for today, Pastor Nigel Corrales. Psalms 122 verse 1 says, I was glad when they said to me, Let us go to the house of the Lord. Let us once again find our joy by worshipping in the house of the Lord today. Amen. Amen. Jesus, oh, for grace to 
Uh, good morning, um, church. Uh, can we close our eyes as we pray? Our Heavenly Father, we want to thank you, Lord, this morning for a wonderful opportunity to come and worship you on your beautiful Sabbath. Dear Lord, we pray in a special way uh, for this service as we are commencing it now. Lord, I want to remember our families that are bereaved. We have lost our head elder, Leon Cranfield, and we also lost our brother, uh, Mark Lawrence. We know that, Lord, it's a very difficult time for the families as well as the church. I pray in a special way, Lord, that may you be with each of the families that uh, are mourning the loss of a loved one. Dear Lord, I present the Cranfield, I present the Lawrence family, that may you draw closer to them, give them comfort, and give them your presence. Whatsoever that they do, Lord, they will always feel your presence. We also want to bring Elder Tommy, who is in hospital. Dear Lord, I pray that you may extend your hand of healing, that Lord, you, you restore his health and his life. It is our prayer, Lord, that we will be with him uh, when he has recovered. Dear Lord, we also want to thank you, Lord, for all the members that we have healed, that we have protected, that we have kept, and that are, are well, glorifying your name. We have testimonies that you have healed our members, and there are so many other members that are also battling COVID and that are, have tested positive. We present them all in your hands and pray that, Lord, may you continue healing and providing recovery. Dear Lord, we present our pastor, Pastor Nigel, who is going to uh, give a, a word of life for today. I know, Lord, you have blessed him, you have inspired him, you have allowed him to prepare a message from above. We pray that, Lord, may that message be an inspiration, encouragement, and also a blessing to all of us. And we also want to pray for all the families uh, that um, are going to listen to that message, that, Lord, may you all draw them to you, and you bless them in a special way. I pray for all those that are going to listen to this message that will inspire them. In Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Are you ready? I'm ready. Are you? It's right around the corner. It's almost here. You are Pathfinders. You are ready. Whatever language you speak, from wherever you are, we are all Pathfinders. One day a year, we all join together as one to celebrate being a Pathfinder. World Pathfinder Day is just around the corner. And even after 71 years, we never stop. Now more than ever before, millions of Pathfinders all around the world are shouting, I will go wherever the Lord calls. September 18, 2021 will be another World Pathfinder Day to remember. Resources for this special event will be available soon at our website, gcyouthministries.org. Every day, every hour, we are Pathfinder Strong, the servants of God, are we? Good morning, Riverside SDA. Happy Sabbath. It is now time for offertory. I'm going to read Mar Mark 3, verse um, 9. So a curse is on you because the whole nation has robbed me. Bring to the storehouse a full tenth of what you earn, so there will be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord, O powerful. I will open the windows of heaven for you and pour out all the blessings you need. 
I will stop the insects so they won't eat your clubs. The grapes won't fall from your wines before they are ready to pick, says the Lord O Powerful. All the nations will call you blessed because you will have a present country, says the Lord O Powerful. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord, for the, all the blessings that you gave us. Above all, Lord, we thank you for the gift of life. We know there is a lot of people who are struggling because of health issues, especially now during this COVID. We put all the people who are sick in hospital in your hands, Lord. We know that you've already started the, the job of healing them. We ask you to continue the work that you've started so that they can come out and be with us or with their families, Lord. Bless each one of us. Bless us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Sabbath. I greet you in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Today we are looking at the book of Revelation chapter 1 verses 9 to 11. And I'm reading from the New King James Version. I, John, your brother and companion in tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, 
was on the island that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. And what you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. The title of our sermon this morning, You Are Not Alone. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before your throne of mercy. And Lord, as it's been a difficult period for each one of us personally and as a church and as a corporate body organized for mission, we know, oh God, that you are still in control. And so this morning we pray for a special blessing upon your word. For you yourself have said, blessed is he who reads and keeps these words. I pray, O oh Lord, that for every listener and everyone who might be searching for meaning during this time, that this message, that your word will glorify you and will draw us nearer to you. I pray not because I'm worthy, but in Jesus' name. Amen. I think of all of us have been in the dark, especially in our country with all these regular load shedding bouts that we've been experiencing. But not many of us have been alone in the dark. I remember visiting the Kango Caves as part of a primary school tour. And uh, as we came into the caves, the tour guide said, I'm going to illustrate something to you. And uh, we were bewildered and amazed at the atmosphere and the setting that we found ourselves in. And he said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch off all the lights so that you can have an idea of what it was to be the first person in these caves, but more importantly, to show you just how dark it was inside. And as he switched off the lights, it was Total darkness. We couldn't see in front of us. You couldn't see your hand. You felt anxious and uncertain. But just as quickly as he turned the light switch off, he turned it back on. And as soon as he turned it back on, we were relieved. We found hope amidst the darkness. And despite feeling alone while the lights were off, when the light came back on, we were at ease. And to dispel the fear, an anxiety caused by the sense of loneliness and darkness that Christians might experience. And especially during John's day, when the church was persecuted for the word of God and the testimony of Jesus, Jesus came to John and he told him, write this letter, which is the book of Revelation. Now it was written by John as the last remaining disciple of the original 12 that walked with Jesus. And John was on the island of Patmos, exiled because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, Patmos had almost no trees, and its total size was 34 kilometers. And more so, there were uh, stone quarries on the island. And so all who were exiled, who were the worst of criminals, would be sent to work in this concentration camp and mine. And there were no trees, so the sun beats each and every day. And John is there, an innocent man, simply because he's proclaiming the word of God and having the testimony of Jesus Christ. And I'm sure John felt alone and in the dark, exiled from everyone else. But Jesus comes to him in a vision and tells him to write what becomes the book of Revelation. Revelation or Apocalypse as what it was written in the New Testament, original language, which was Greek, it means to reveal how things are and how they will be from the time between Christ's first coming and Christ's second coming. And so Revelation reveals, it uncovers, it unveils. Its visions, though scary, paint a picture which are there to vividly and brightly dispel loneliness and darkness. They open our eyes to the reality of things past, of things present, and things in the future. And when Jesus commissioned John 
to write all that he would be shown. The churches in Asia were to understand that despite their circumstances, despite the fear, the uncertainty, the anxiety, despite them feeling alone and in darkness, that there was a realm beyond their earthly senses. This is one of the most fundamental truths of the faith. Remember God said in the beginning, Genesis chapter 1 verse 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And so the earthly is what we see, what we touch, what we taste, what we feel, and what we smell. But the heavenly realm, and with rare exception, lies beyond our perception. When you go to what Paul writes in Colossians chapter 1 verse 50, he says that Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For him, by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. So, what we are being taught here is that this heavenly, invisible, spiritual realm is what God reveals to us through the writing of John to the churches and to us. And just like the relief that I felt when the tour guide turned the lights back on in the Kango Caves, Revelation is that light showing us the reality of things, not as we see with our earthly senses, but as God sees. And His vision is much better than ours. The saying goes that all lines converge at the top. And so God shows John what he sees, and it's sent to John so that he could comfort the churches. And so here in Revelation chapter 1 verse 9, we come to the first vision where John introduces what he saw. And he writes, I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation, take note, and the kingdom, take note, and the patient endurance that are in Jesus, take note, was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus and to Smyrna and to Pergamos and to Thyatira and to Sardis and to Philadelphia and to Laodicea. Now there are a number of things that are introduced to us in these first few verses. And what we need to take note of is that John introduces himself referring to himself as your brother and partner in three things, in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus. And so already John is being told here and being showed that despite him being on an exiled island in a concentration camp, mining in his old age, weary, battle-scarred, that he is not alone. And though his natural senses might have believed him, led him to believe that he was alone, the reality was that he was not. And therefore John refers to himself as your brother and partner. And this is a comforting truth which reminds us that we are not alone, especially during this time. John has a lot to say to the churches, but he begins by saying, I'm with you in this. You are not alone. And today we have three lessons that we can learn from this passage of Scripture. And if you're like me, you love it when the preacher says, we only have three points, because when we get to the second point, we know that we are almost done. And so the first lesson that we learn from this, that Jesus tells John to write to us, is that we are not alone in tribulation. Notice how John introduces himself. I'm your brother and partner in what? In tribulation. Now there's a popular view that thinks that the tribulation being described here is something confined to a short period of time and that it's far in our future and it's something that Christians will be spared from. And this thought, if you develop it according to a popular view among Christianity today, 
is that Christians before this tribulation will be raptured secretly before it begins. Where they find this in scripture, this secret rapture preceding this period of tribulation, I don't know. And I've even heard of some people who hold this view who are called pre-tribulational or pre-millennial. They say that God would never allow his people to suffer tribulation. They insist that God will remove his people from the world before the tribulation comes. But when you look at the world in its current state, and you look at what the Bible says, you don't have to go further than John chapter 16 verse 33, where Jesus says, I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have what? Tribulation. But take heart. I have overcome the world. And even there in verse 9 of Revelation chapter 1, it states that John refers to himself as a brother and partner in tribulation. And so we clearly see that tribulation, affliction, suffering, persecution, anguish, was something that John himself was enduring when he wrote, and when he wrote to the churches, and when he wrote to us. The tribulation my brothers and sisters, is not something in the future. It is clearly present. The constant teaching of Scripture makes it clear that the age between Christ's first coming and Christ's second coming will be marked by tribulation. And the tribulation increases in intensity the nearer we come to the second coming. Now granted, the tribulation takes different forms and some experience tribulation in varying degrees. But Christians living in this world, one thing the Bible makes it clear, tribulation, affliction, anguish is something common to the people of God, especially those who live in these last days, the days between Christ's first coming and his second coming. And there will indeed be a great time of tribulation. That is a time of unparalleled tribulation, immediately preceding the second coming of Christ. But here we see in Revelation 1 verse 9 that John's focus is upon the tribulation that he and the churches were experiencing long ago. You go to Revelation 7 verse 14 and it speaks of the greater time of tribulation. The Apostle Paul expresses his thoughts on this in Romans chapter 8 verse 16 where he says, The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and fellow heirs with Christ, provided that we what? That we suffer with Him in order that we may also be glorified with Him. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Brothers and sisters, When we suffer in this world as we are suffering now, we suffer with Christ because we participate in His sufferings. For He Himself suffered so that we can have a hope. And we suffer not as enemies of God, but we suffer as His beloved children. For we are heirs with Christ. When we experience tribulation, it is not as enemies of God, but as His beloved children. And Paul says, our suffering is not meaningless, but it is for a purpose. And perhaps you hear me say that and you question and wonder, how can I say that suffering is not meaningless? When you hear of children who just have lunch and they are bombed. When you hear of a freak accident. When your friends die. By this disease. How can you say that it is not meaningless? You see, brothers and sisters, we are living in tribulation. And as the tribulation increases, so will the suffering. But we suffer not alone. We are heirs with Christ. And He will reveal to us the meaning of our suffering. We are called. To bait and to understand and to know 
that despite what we go through, we are not alone in tribulation. For God, through the suffering, is working in us a glory to which the sufferings of the present age do not compare to the eternal glory that we will experience. How important us is for us to understand the role of suffering in the Christian life. It is for the glory of God and it is for our good. And though we cannot see it, we cannot understand it. The Word of God teaches us that we suffer not as enemies, but as children of God. God might be refining His bride through the trials of this life. And we should not be surprised by tribulation. Do not assume that God is distant when it comes or that He is uncaring. The Word of God teaches quite the opposite. He has ordained that we walk through tribulation for His glory and our good. And He has promised to sustain us through to the very end. For He is our Father and we are His children. We are not alone in tribulation, brothers and sisters. The second lesson that we learn is that we are not alone in the kingdom. Now John says, I am your brother and partner in the tribulation and in the kingdom. So we are not alone in this kingdom. We have this in common. We are citizens of the kingdom of God. Revelation chapter 1 verse 5 states that Jesus is called the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings on earth. And in verse 6, he reminds us that Christ has made us a kingdom, priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. And so Jesus Christ is in fact king over all, for all authority in heaven and earth has been given to him. But not everyone submits to his authority. There are those who are in his kingdom, and there are those who are out. It is those who have believed upon him, who have bowed the knee to him, who have confessed this and who have repented and accepted his sacrifice that are citizens of his kingdom. It is those who are not, who are outside. And the kingdom of God is here now. Christ is ruling now. And we are citizens of this kingdom. His kingdom is present wherever the church is present. And his kingdom advances wherever the gospel is preached. And the Holy Spirit makes the preaching effective. It draws men and women to bow before Jesus Christ. For he says, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to me. This kingdom is not future. It is here now. John was in the kingdom with the Christians living in his day. And it is here with us. But the revelation gives us a vision of the kingdom when it will come into its fullness. When all who are in the world, who no matter what they lose and troubles they go through, will be glorified in the kingdom when the trumpet of God sounds on that beautiful morning. Brothers and sisters, we must remember, never forget, we are citizens of the kingdom of God. And this kingdom is not a stagnant kingdom. It is a conquering kingdom. It is an aggressive kingdom. It is one that is always on the move. It is always advancing. It is always moving forward. And to put it another way, this kingdom of God is a kingdom at war. It is a kingdom in a great controversy. It is dissatisfied with its current boundaries. It is discontent with its current population. It is always expanding, constantly at war, seeking to gain more territory and to enlist more citizens. And of course, in this kingdom at war, our spiritual weapons are not those like swords, those that are physical, but our warfare, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4, are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. In other words, we fight not with the sword, but with the word of God and the spirit. For our battle is a spiritual battle, but the warfare is real indeed. And we are partners together in this kingdom. 
we are all to work together for the promotion of this kingdom to see its advancement. The book of Revelation reveals to us this reality that we are in a war and this is the war for the ages. We are not alone in our tribulation and we are not alone as citizens in the kingdom of God. Lastly, we are not alone as we endure. John Rhee says, I am your brother and partner in tribulation, in the kingdom of God, and in patient endurance as it is in Jesus. We are not alone as we endure. Endurance is what is called for. The people of God must patiently endure as they suffer tribulation in this kingdom. And this is why when you go to Revelation 14 verse 12, it says, Here is the patience of the saints, the endurance, who keep the commandments of God and have the faith in Jesus. We must patiently endure in order to receive the reward. We, like Christ, must persevere and persevere, pardon, to the very end. We must endure in Christ, looking to Him as our example, but also depending on Him for strength. And this is why Paul wrote those words in Philippians 4 verse 30. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It's not that He is doing something. It is that He is receiving these blows, but He can endure the suffering, the tribulation, because Christ gives Him the strength. John wrote, from the island called Patmos, and he was there on the account of the word of God and the faith, the testimony of Jesus. In other words, the Romans sent him to Patmos to work in a labor camp, which is more a concentration camp, because they viewed him as a threat to their society, because of his constant testimony for Jesus Christ. That's why he was there. He was an old man. By this time and he was probably forced to do hard labor in those stone quarries and john tells us that while feeling alone and in the dark and uncertain and anxious and fearful that the lord came to him and he was in the spirit on the lord's day and that day is the sabbath day and that is significant for it is on the sabbath day that christ appears to john and he's seen walking amongst these churches. It is a small detail in the text, but we should not overlook it. Christ fellowships with his people in a pronounced way on the Lord's Sabbath. Even as we gather on this platform, Christ is with us. The reference where John says, I was in the Spirit, it reminds us of the experience of the Old Testament prophets. The prophet Daniel and Ezekiel were caught up by the Spirit or made to be in the Spirit before seeing the visions that they saw. John's experience was the same. The phrase appears many times throughout the book of Revelation, but it marks the transition between one vision to the next. There's always movement in this kingdom. Always. And notice what John says. He says before he saw who was speaking to him, he heard who was speaking to him. And he phrases it this way. He says, I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet. Now, can you imagine something blowing a trumpet in your ears? Remember that the blast of a trumpet signaled the Lord's descent when he came to meet Moses on Mount Sinai. You can find that in the Exodus chapter 19 verse 16. And the trumpet being blown was later associated with the Lord entering his temple. Psalms 47 verse 5. Trumpets were used in the Old Testament to rally the troops for battle. And trumpets were used to call the people of God together for worship. The trumpet would be blown on the Day of Atonement every 50th year to signal the liberation that had come to God's people who were oppressed and in slavery. And so when the voice of Christ is described as the sound of a trumpet, all of these things come to John's mind. That old, weary, battle-scarred John. Jesus had descended to meet him, as he did with Moses, to reveal the plan for the future. A plan 
to encourage those who were feeling alone and in darkness. The sound of the trumpet announced that Jesus would stand in the midst of his temple, in the midst of his churches. The trumpet blast of Christ's voice is meant to tell us that despite John feeling alone and in the dark, that Jesus was with him, Jesus was with the churches, and Jesus is with us. And what did the voice say that sounded like a blast of a trumpet? John writes, Write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches. Now these churches were all in Asia as the churches there experienced hardship in the Roman Empire. This was the capital, so to say, of Christianity in its early days. This was where the gospel of Jesus would spread like fire throughout the then known world. And it's not until verse 12 of Revelation 1 that John actually sees who's talking to him. But when he turns to see the voice that sounds like a trumpet that tells him to write down and send it to the seven churches, he sees the following. I saw seven golden lampstands, and these represent the seven churches. And if we pay close, attest, close attention to the Old Testament, we will remember that the lampstand was positioned within the holy place, within the tabernacle, and later within the temple that was built. And the lampstand symbolized that God, the one who was then hidden behind the veil in the most holy place, was in fact with his people, blessing them with the light of his presence. And in particular, the lampstand in the temple is Old Testament language. It is used so that we can understand the connection with the Holy Spirit. When you go to the book of Zechariah chapter 4, it makes this connection. The people of God have themselves been enlightened by the Holy Spirit. And they have been empowered to shine as lights in a world that is experiencing loneliness, that is experiencing darkness, uncertainty, fear, and anxiety. Remember that in Revelation 1 verse 4, the Spirit of God is described as the seven spirits were before God's throne. Revelation 4 verse 5, John sees a vision where the seven torches of fire are the seven spirits of God. And so the seven lampstands represent the seven churches. And the book of Revelation picks up on the Old Testament imagery that would have applied only to Israel under the Old Covenant. It applies to us as the church. It is the church that is represented by the lampstand here. And this is significant, not simply because of facts. It is significant in that those who have faith in Jesus, the church, are the true people of God. They are the ones who have been enlightened by the Holy Spirit. They have been empowered by the Holy Spirit to shine in this lonely and dark world. But notice what John sees next. He describes in Revelation 1 verse 13. In the midst of the lampstands was one like a son of man. That is the word, the phrase that Daniel uses describing Jesus. The son of man clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white like wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace. And his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. So John sees Jesus, no longer the man of poverty who walked on this earth ministering for three and a half years with him. Now he sees Jesus ministering in the heavenly temple. And notice where Jesus is. He is seen walking in the midst of the lampstands. This is symbolic of the reality that Christ is with us. Think of how encouraging this would have been to the seven churches in Asia Minor in John's day. Facing persecution, loneliness and darkness, trying to hide and shut out the light. The reality that Jesus was with him. Think how encouraging this would have been for John exiled, forced to work as an old man, 
lonely and in darkness. Think how this is written for you and me. Brother and partner, Christ himself shows he is with us. And he is in the midst of us in every place and in every age. And though we cannot see him with our earthly sense, he is indeed walking in our midst. This is meant to bring encouragement to you and me, brothers and sisters. This is why Psalms 46 rings so true. That despite the loneliness and darkness and anxiety and fear and uncertainty, despite the loss of everything, loss of our materials, of our employment, loss of our health, loss of our loved ones, loss of our lives, despite all this, Jesus is with us. Psalms 46 verse 6 and 7 says, Therefore we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling, though the nations rage and the kingdoms totter, the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Later when you go in Revelation, you see all these becoming reality. As the earth gives way and mountains tremble and the waters roar and the nations rage, but God is with us. So for you and me today, beloved, living in a global crisis plagued with uncertainty and fear, where loneliness and darkness tries to shut out the light of Jesus Christ. For John living on that exiled island and the first century Christians experiencing harsh persecution, Jesus gives this vision to let us know, despite everything, all the suffering, Jesus is with us. And our sufferings now in the present time are not worth comparing to the eternal glory that we shall experience if we remain faithful to Jesus. Jesus is with us in tribulation, in the kingdom, and in patient endurance. Jesus gives this vision, this revelation, to comfort and encourage us. We have the assurance, as John and the seven churches, that we are not alone. The same Jesus here fulfills in part his promise to John that he made in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 to 20, where he told his disciples before he was to ascend, I am with you to the very end of the age. And this is important because that same Jesus Christ starts Revelation by saying, I am the firstborn of the dead. I am the first and the last. I am the Alpha and the Omega. Jesus is with us from the beginning to the end. Brothers and sisters, we have experienced hard times personally as a church, as a country, as a world. We, as Christ's followers, have not been spared from the tribulation. But we know that the Bible says our sufferings in present cannot compare to the eternal glory which is in Jesus Christ. That we suffer not as enemies of God, but that God is with us. We suffer as heirs of God, as His beloved children. And He does not move away from us, or forget us, or forsake us. He walks with us as Jesus walks in the midst of those seven churches. Brothers and sisters, Christ is with us. He is with us. He has not left us. In Revelation, the promise is shown that it will be fulfilled. The day is coming. When we shall suffer no more, that tribulations will cease, that we will be in the fulfilled kingdom of God in all its fullness, that we will no longer have to patiently endure, that we will no longer be scorned and suffer because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. 
Jesus is coming soon. Let us be faithful. Jesus is with us. We are not alone. Amen. Let us close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace and your mercy towards us. We thank you that you are still on the throne. We pray, Lord, for forgiveness where we have sinned against you. We pray, Lord, that your kingdom and your will be done. We pray, Lord, that your name will be hallowed and lifted up. We pray, Lord, that you will Help us to understand that despite all that we have lost, that you are with us. I pray, O oh God, for each person who can hear and listen, that you will help them to understand that we are not alone in tribulation. We are not alone as citizens of your kingdom. And we are not alone as we patiently endure for the sake of Jesus Christ. Lord, our hearts long for the day when suffering and tribulation and affliction and persecution and sickness and loss and death shall be no more. Help us to be faithful, Lord, until that day. In Jesus' name, Amen. It's not an easy road. It's not an easy road. It's not it is not an easy road. It's we are traveling to heaven, though many other thorns on the way. But the Savior is with us, His presence.
presence gives us joy every day. No, 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 no. It is not an easy road. No, 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 no. It is not an easy road. It's not. Jesus walks beside us, it's and he brightens easy. the journey, and lightens every heavy load. No, 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 it is not an easy road. But Jesus walks beside us, and He brightens the journey, and lightens every heavy load. And lightens every Traveling to heaven, though many other thorns on the way, but Jesus walks beside us and brightens the journey. Heavy load, it is not an easy road. We are traveling to heaven. No, no, it's not an easy road. No, no, it's not an easy road. No, no, it's not an easy road. We are traveling to heaven.